You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now, Sam Hankin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop, uh, which I own, and which fortuitously has just won the best bookshop in Philadelphia. And I didn't stuff the ballot box. Well, maybe slightly, but no matter. We also won the best non-corporate coffee shop on the main line. I don't know what that means, but people come into the shop just to ask, what does that mean? So at least it gets them inside where I can do my excellent soft sell. For example, this week I'm pushing Molecules by Theo Gray with amazing photographs by Nick Mann. It was released on October 15th and published by Black Dog and Leventhal, distributed by Workman. Theo is the author of Elements, the precursor of Molecules, and writes the Gray Matter column for Popular Science. He's also the developer of the Elements app on Apple, which is an incredible application, and lots of other award-winning apps and books, and hopefully Molecules will be one of them. Molecules is the successor volume to Elements, which was a fascinating look at the 103 pure atomic substances of nature, although some of them don't last too long. It explores each with clarity, functionality, and humor in no particular order. I was kind of fine with Elements because I could always pretend that I understood the periodic table, especially the noble gases, which I always um, mnemonically recalled as hello, new alumni and returning kids, because it's helium, neon, argon, radon, and krypton. But now I'm some, somewhat lost because Theo has inundated me and us with hundreds of hand-picked molecules, those which suit his fancy, and carbon chains with all kinds of other atoms stuck to them, and electron shells and valences, which have always perplexed me. Uh, so we have, as Theo says, an explosion of possibilities with regard to molecular combinations. And now, as always, I've gone on too long, so welcome, Theo, and thanks for joining us today. Hi, I'm great. To, uh, happy to be here. So let's start at the beginning uh, for everyone. What are molecules? Well, molecules are basically what you get when you take elements and put them together. So you, you combine different elements, you bond them to each other with chemical bonds, and what you get are called molecules. And so the connections, if, if we're talking about uh, atoms, it, it's a simple, essentially a nucleus, protons, and electrons, correct? Right. Well, you've got, in the nucleus, you've got protons and neutrons, and then way, way far away surrounding them, you've got electrons. So, um, again, to ask it as a layman would, how, I know you explain uh, the electron shells, how do they hook together, these atomic substances? in a manner in which they create the molecules of everyday life, whether, as you talk about, rope or super sweet substances or fats or oils, what is it that allows them to um, combine? Well, one of the problems with that is that it's, it's basically a quantum mechanical phenomenon, so things get kind of weird. Um, but you can more or less think of it as uh, electrostatic attraction. So when you, like if you rub a balloon on your shirt and then it, it stick it to the wall, uh, that electric charge in the balloon being attracted to an opposite charge in the wall. Uh, and just like with magnets, just like, you know, two south poles repel each other and, and a north and a south pole attract each other, same thing with electricity. Uh, two negative charges repel, a negative and a positive attract. The electrons are negatively charged, the nuclei are positively charged. And if you put, let's say, for example, two uh, atomic nuclei at a certain distance, Part, you got two positive charges there trying to push each other away, but in between them you put some electrons. They're negatively charged. Now you've got both the nuclei are being pulled together by those electrons in the middle, and that can be a stable configuration. In fact, that's how chemical bonds work, is you have these positively charged nuclei arranged in different ways, and as glue in between them, you have a bunch of negatively charged electrons uh, that are essentially forming the bonds between them. And them. Well, it's funny, but, you know, we all have this, and you talk about this a lot in your book, you know, we all have this image that I learned in the 60s, which, which was of this little solar system um, with the nucleus and the protons and uh, the electrons spinning around like little planets. And, you know, you uh, pro properly and rightfully debunk this and talk about the way that electrons are both waves and particles, and when that wave function collapses, when we observe it, it becomes one or the other. And every science writer that I've talked to mentions Einstein and says how kind of almost disgusted he was with this when he said, God does not play dice with the universe. Maybe you could explain that a little more so that our listeners could understand 
how that works. Yeah, well, like I say, it's, you know, quantum mechanics is weird, and electrons are, you know, quantum mechanical objects. So, in fact, you know, you can talk about there being an electron between these two nuclei, but it isn't really in one particular place. And when you talk about them being in an atom whizzing around, they're not really whizzing around. They're kind of more like being there in a general sense. And, uh, you know, when they're in a molecule, they're kind of, you know, you might think of them as sort of whizzing around between multiple nuclei, between, you know, between multiple atoms. But they're not really whizzing around between them. They're more like sort of existing in the space between. And on the one hand, this sounds very weird. But on the other hand, there's actually you know, things that we're familiar with. Uh, and, and an example of that is a, a wave, where if you have, a let's say, a string uh, that's stretched between two points and it's vibrating, uh, like a guitar string, you can't really ask, you know, where on the string is that wave. It isn't in a particular place on the wave. It's kind of on, on a string. It's kind of a property of the whole string. And it might be, you know, one harmonic or another uh, that will make that same string play different notes. And again, there aren't in, they aren't in particular places. They're just sort of properties of the whole thing. Um, and likewise, electrons, they don't necessarily exist in a particular place in space. They're more like a property that exists within a, a volume of space. What Einstein was particularly talking about was... Uh, certain uh, quantum mechanical properties, the theory says very clearly that they are random and that it, it's sort of a fundamental part of the theory that there can't be any sort of hidden underlying, they're called hidden variables, um, that would explain that randomness and mean that it's not really random, that it's really the result of some kind of uh, you know, mechanism going on inside that we can't see. The theory says there is no such mechanism. It is purely random. And you know, Einstein is not the only one who is very uncomfortable with that notion that it sort of it can't be understood, it can't be broken down, it can't be explained in terms of something that we just don't understand yet. I kind of like the scariness of it. It it gives, you know, just like Schrodinger's cat, it kind of gives a little bit of mystery to the universe that that you don't know what's going on and you can't tell where something is. Like the slit experiment, you can't tell where something is until you actually look at it. I, I, I think it adds a lot of, I don't know, kind of a romantic view of the universe to me. I, well, it certainly is mystery. And yeah. I think it's, you know, it's very clear that this is not understood yet. You know, there's, you know, this, quantum mechanics is a, uh, is a theory that produces incredibly good results. Like, you can do calculations on exactly how things behave, and it's always exactly right. And yet, at its core, it's unsatisfying. And... Uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people who feel that, you know, including people in the field who, you know, who understand perfectly well what a good theory it is and how precise it is mathematically, but who also understand that there's got to be something that we're missing, uh, that there is some sort of a deeper truth that's uh, accessible eventually. Switching topics, why is it that both in elements and in molecules, and even when I saw you on the early show, why is it that I'm reading a book about elements or molecules and I'm laughing out loud? Why, how, did you, how do you come to inject this amount of humor in it? And there's, is there some type of agenda that you have that like, makes the knowledge more accessible because it's funny, like when you're talking about that polypropylene rope that's uncomfortable in your hands? Um, well, I don't know. I think it's maybe sort of immaturity or something. Um, <laughs> I mean, one of the things that, like, it always surprises me when I get emails from people who read my book or, or when I do talks and people show up is how often it's kids, like 8-year-olds or 10-year-olds or something. And I didn't really have any idea that I was a children's book author. I didn't set out to be one. I didn't intend to write a book for kids. But, you know, I think maybe I'm just not entirely grown up. Um, and, you know, I kind of... Um, maybe don't have enough of a, uh, an internal sensor or something, because if you're writing about polypropylene rope, maybe the fact that it annoys me isn't really the most, you know, informative or erudite thing to say about it. But it is kind of like, it's what I, well, every time I think about that rope, I can't stand it. I hate that rope, um, you know, compared to a really beautiful nylon or, uh, uh, you know, polyester rope, which are, which are, you know, beautiful, smooth, uh, silky sorts of things. I don't know. I think that um, does. I think that does inform the reader. All those sensory 
uh, images that you create, just the fact that, you know, you can almost feel your hands sliding along it. And I know what it feels like, too. And it is off-putting. But then again, when you talk about that yellow toe strap that I have in my car right now, it's really a good image because you talk about it in terms of the difference between it and a chain and also that you better get the hell out of the way of the yellow toe strap if you pull too hard. Those kinds of things are great, I think. Yeah. Well, and the fact that that yellow toe strap, if you just kind of close your eyes and don't think about the fact that it's a big, tough piece of farm equipment or something, you feel it. It feels like silk. It really does. Yeah. And in fact, as, as you'll see in another section of the book, it feels so much like silk that you know, the synthetics like that, actually, even experts often can't tell the difference between genuine silk and that type of synthetic by feel alone. You know, even if that's your business, you can't be sure. Um, and, and you have to, there's a, a very easy way of telling, which is that you take a, 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 bit, a little bit of it and you burn it. And it turns out, you know, when you burn silk, it behaves very differently than when you burn any synthetic <laughs> imitation silk. Yeah, but that's the way to tell. You can't tell it just by feeling it. And you seem very, uh, in, I don't know, um, fascinated by that because it, it, the, there's a synthetic thing and a, I'm, I'm almost going to say a real thing. And there is a difference between them, but like you said, even experts can't tell the difference. So again, for us lay people, what is the difference in reality between the molecules that occur naturally in nature, kind of, and the ones that we synthesize. Well, so you have there's different kinds of imitation. So, you know, let's, I mean, this is actually not particularly in the molecules book. It's a little bit more in the elements book. So I talk about uh, imitation diamonds. So when you go to, the, to Walmart or something and you buy a cheap engagement ring, it's cubic zirconia. And it kind of looks like diamond, but it is not diamond at all. It's a completely different substance. Um, it happens to be, you know, very hard and very sparkly, but it's zirconium oxide. It's not carbon, which is what diamonds are made of. But if you go and you get a synthetic ruby, synthetic rubies are the same crystal, the same chemical substance, the same crystal structure as a natural ruby. So, you know, in what sense is that imitation? It, the, the difference is just that one of them was dug out of the ground and the other one was made in a lab. They're the same thing. Um, and that occurs in, uh, you know, in all kinds of situations. My favorite example is vanilla, uh, the flavoring vanilla. So there's a, there's a particular chemical called vanillin, not surprisingly. Um, and if you uh, grow vanilla beans in Madagascar somewhere and you harvest them and you ferment them and you do all these things to them that you need to do, uh, you eventually extract out um, an extract, which is mostly vanilla. There's a, you know, there'll be a few little other impurities that come into it, which add some flavor to it. But pretty much the vast bulk of the flavor of natural vanilla is this molecule vanilla. And it's very expensive because it's hard to grow that stuff. It has to be pollinated by hand, and it's a, you know, it's a tropical rainforest plantation sort of situation. Um, but it turns out you can make exactly the same molecule in a laboratory, synthetically, or in a factory for that matter, for you know pennies. And you can buy like a pound of it on eBay for a few dollars huge quantities of this vanilla and it is absolutely precisely the same molecule there's no chemical test that you can apply to determine which one is natural and which one is synthetic because they're you know they're the same thing they're equivalent uh, they're yeah well they're just like you couldn't distinguish them if you had one of each uh you couldn't distinguish them by any chemical means you certainly can't taste the difference unless you're tasting the impurities well if we go, um, if we go back to like the simplest element of hydrogen. Well, no, let's go. Let's go to carbon because we're talking about diamonds, and I guess we would be talking about graphite. And that leads to the idea that we're carbon-based life forms. See if you can. Ex no, of course, you can explain why carbon is such a pleasant thing to have, uh, because it likes to have things join it to create a crowd. Why well, is that? What, yeah, I mean, what carbon can do that no other element can do is it's able to form these kind of chains and loop and rings and loops and, and all these very complicated structures um, out of which you can build big complicated sort of functional molecules with the ultimate examples of course being proteins and DNA which you know they contain various other elements you always have hydrogen you often have some oxygen or some, some sulfur some potassium 
uh, some nitrogen. Um, uh, but basically, the the complexity of the structure, the thing that's kind of carrying all of the burden of um, being able to make backbones of molecules is always carbon. And it's always linked, you know, carbon to carbon to carbon to carbon. Um, and that's just sort of a, you know, a, a, an accidental property of uh, the way that the electrons fit around the carbon atom. That it happens to be able to do this. It happens to be able to make structures that are, um, you know, complicated and stable uh, in the conditions that we happen to have here. You know, you talk about kids, and I agree, um, and I've even talked to people who feel that, um, especially the periodic table, it's so uh, accessible to children because it's so regular and because it's so well designed after all these years. But one thing you talk about that kids don't have access to now, and you seem upset by it, I know I am, is a good chemistry set. Talk a little bit about the one you like so much and why it's important to you, just like your book about here's experiments you can do but probably shouldn't. Um, talk about why you, the idea of knowledge gained through a good chemistry set. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, what, if, if chemistry is your thing, then you should have a good chemistry set. But what I, I think is generally absolutely true is that kids ought to get out and do something um, and, you know, not, not just kind of look at simulations or videos on a computer. Uh, and, uh, you know, a good chemistry set is an excellent way of, of sort of learning of unmediated uh, lessons about the world. Uh, sometimes things work, sometimes they don't. Uh, you can you, know, you can end up doing powerful things with, uh, if you know what you're doing, you mix the right things together and, you know, make something happen. It's, it's exciting. It's sort of discovering uh, things about the world yeah. uh, as opposed to being told things about the world. Unfortunately, my uncle, who's a dentist, gave us, when I was eight, my brother was six, he gave us a big vial of mercury which we then played with, held, tried to freeze, and then put our hands in our mouths, no doubt, and now we have brains full of mercury, probably. But uh, Actually, probably not. Chances are not. Because actually metallic mercury like that yeah. is uh, among the less toxic forms of mercury. Um, not that I'm recommending people play with it, but it turns out that when you know people are freaked out about mercury poisoning, um, and, and it is a, a very serious issue, it's mostly the organic mercury compounds, like methyl mercury, which is what when you're eating, you know, a lot of fish, for example, uh, you worry about mercury contamination. Um, it's, it's not actually mercury metal, like the silvery stuff that you play with, that is what you're talking about. It's these compounds. Well, um, now, my so, bro- uh, now my brother eats sushi five times a week, so I guess he actually does tuna, so I guess... Yeah, yeah. right. I mean, I would actually worry a little bit more about the, the, the excessive fish consumption than about, uh, you know, a few... Um, you, you know, a, a few minutes playing with mercury when you're a kid. I mean, again, not not that I would recommend doing this, and certainly if you're going to, it should be in a well-ventilated area because mercury vapors that are the most um, the most problem when you inhale them. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a pity. There's all these things that were so much fun before we found out how poisonous they were. I know. Magnesium ribbon was really fun. Yeah, really? That, that's actually still fine. You can, you can burn that all you want <laughs> as long as you don't stare at it too much and blind yourself. Yeah, I know. I remember... Well, you know, we probably shouldn't talk more uh, more about the book until we talk a little bit about your buddy and your collaborator, Nick Mann, who both of you guys are in Urbana. I always wondered how you guys got together, and he created, along with you, these fantastic images um, and, and such a well-designed yeah, so, book. Uh, Nick is a remarkable photographer. So I actually I met him when he was maybe 16. I think I hired him when he was 17. We met through a, uh, a friend, and... Um, he says he was homeschooled. I kind of refer to it more like feral, um, like raised by wolves or something. And basically, he kind of grew up teaching himself photography and got pretty good at it. And I was, you know, I was needing somebody to help with uh, photographing these elements. In particular, we do this on a turntable where we get uh, like a complete rotation of every object that we then uh, use to make apps and videos and things where you can, you know, in the app form of the, the book, you can spin things with your finger. Um, and he just got better and better at that. And he's now, um, you know, I think unquestionably the world's expert on photographing elements and molecules and things like that. Uh, and he's, he's branched out through uh, my company, Touch Press, to doing um, a variety of different objects. We did hundreds of skulls for a book on skulls, which is the most beautiful skulls you've ever seen, all of them rotating. So you can see them from all sides, which is 
particularly good for skulls. Uh, and we've done, you know, historical objects from the British Museum and and uh, the Science Museum in London, and uh, instruments. Uh, we had a we had a one and a half million dollar violin hanging from fishing line, uh, being rotated around the circle. Uh, and that yeah, he's just he's just really good at it. Um, yeah, it's this, you know, even when you look at Elements, the app, which I bought way before I knew about you, and just, if you're going to pay for an app, man, it's the best app to pay for, and, and again, for kids, it's wonderful, and now, you know, when I when I um, updated it, you know, you have a little um, taste, teaser of Elements in Action, which is amazing, I mean, what kid wouldn't want to watch these things, so it's... Yeah, they're cool videos, those are mostly shot, actually, by my colleague, Matt Whitby. Oh, okay. The, uh, yeah, I had heard of him. Okay. Talk a little bit about the fact that, uh, that you have four jobs. You talk about on your website. So you have this, you have Is your... Is that the four now? You said, you, said uh, you had four, unless you were lying. You said. Well, you, I'm just trying to... I'm trying to tell you count. So, so um, Wolfram Research is kind of... Uh, uh, really like a, more like a former job now. I pretty much don't, don't work on Mathematica anymore. But um, that was uh, Mathematica and Wolfram Alpha is a, a thing that people may be familiar with. Yeah, when I went and to the there's... when I went to the bookstore and bought a new kind of science, I right. bought it, took it home, and I was so overwhelmed that I might as well have used it as a doorstop. I mean, it's a, it's great. It's just beyond me. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that, so that was that's Stephen Wolfram, and um, uh, you know, we were two of the, um, well, you know, he was he was the principal founder of Wolfram Research. I was kind of a hanger on. Um, uh, and then there's Touch Press, which is my app publishing company. Uh, and then there's uh, my whole, you know, sort of science elements business, periodiccable.com and the like. And what's my fourth job? I guess there's the, the quilts. quilting enterprise. You're, yeah, the quilting enterprise. Which is fascinating because I looked at that, all that stuff too, which is great. Yeah, so that's palegraylabs.com, I guess, the main thing. Plus, plus Quilt Bank is actually quilt, quiltbank.com, which is my favorite manifestation station of that project right now um which is a, basically a project to make uh, quilted money <laughs> our first our first project uh, project is a thousand dollar bill which you can buy at face value because it's money there's no you know you, you can't buy discounted money that's just thousand dollars thousand dollars you can trade it um and uh, we're going to have different denominations at some point and we'll, you'll be able to exchange them because i'm going to run a central bank for this soft money so it's like a, uh, it's like a Bitcoin in real life. Yeah, well, soft money. I mean, it's it's quilted money. You can you can make soft money contributions. Um, we have a laundry service. If your money is dirty, we will launder it for you. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do with soft money that you can't do with regular money. Well, what's really cool about it too is that you do something that nobody else can do by hand. That in all of history has been done by hand. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess you can do it by hand. I mean, there, I guess there, you know, really there are tap hard. tapestries, but yeah, you you spend a year. You know, you have a room full of people working on it for a year if you wanted to do that number of stitches. I did a actually ten thousand uh, dollars on one sheet of fabric, one point eight million stitches. Wow! Um, put through that one piece of fabric, um, and it's just it's an incredible amount of thread uh, and it's an incredible machine. If you look on our website, we've got a I saw picture it. of the machine. It's, it's a really cool machine. There's a whole lot of them outside of China because um, they're mostly used for kind of you know manufacturing uh, on an industrial scale, and they they use it for much simpler things. They're really kind of pushing that machine to the edges of its capabilities. Uh, and oh yeah, and you, you might as well, you should mention your collaborator on that because she seems like a very nice person. Oh yeah, so the, right, that's that's my girlfriend Nina Paley, who uh, annoyingly is more famous. Than, uh, the, the worst case was I was actually I was at a chemistry conference, an American Chemical Society meeting, at which I had spoken, and we were walking across the hall, and some guy came running up and said, "Are you Nina Paley?" <laughs> and it's like, "Come on, this is I'm on my own turf here." Um, but she's uh, she's an animator, and she's primarily known for a film called Pizza Sings the Blues," and more recently for a short called "This Land Is Mine," which went viral about two months ago. Um, and I like the way that she and you both talk about copyright, too. Maybe you ought to say a sentence or two about that, because it's really fascinating. Well, that's kind of her thing. She's a, she's a, um, a, 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 a very aggressive anti-copyright 
um, free culture advocate. Uh, you know, her like her movies are all completely open, free to download. You can do anything you want with it. You can take them, you can turn them into commercial products, you can reuse any of the images. She deeply believes in the right to um, to free access to any of this sort of creative work. Um, I, on the other hand, work for you know in an environment where everything is copyrighted. <laughs> so you know, like my apps are copyrighted. My books are published by publishers who you know, feel pretty strongly about copyright. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of a different, um, it's a different way of working, a different way of looking at things and a different set of economics um, that works for different people. Yeah, I like the way, uh, but, I like the way on her website she says, hey, if you have money and you feel like sending me money, it's, yeah, that'd be nice. But, you know, it's just such a nice way of doing it, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, it's great. And she makes a very nice living. Now, that's, that, that giant machine that's her machine uh not mine um and her film you know I, I, she's made way more money on that film giving it away than she would have uh trying to you know go through the normal uh system of uh, distributors and things um it uh you know really worked out very well for her i think you know my product in my situation the things that i work on are different in nature, and I happen to think that it works out better in the more traditional, um, you know, the sort of more traditional copyright realm. But you know, I see your point, and uh, it works very well for her. Well, going back to selling your books, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I like the, the and we can end with this. I like the last chapter in which you talk about the fact that you're not going to talk too much about DNA, but you talk about it in terms of a library or a book and how a gene is essentially a book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so it's basically, that's a punt on proteins and DNA, that last chapter, because what I realized as I was trying to think about, you know, a chapter, because obviously DNA is a molecule, proteins are molecules, and what I realized was that, yes, technically they're molecules, but you really don't talk about them or think about them in the same way as you do all the other molecules that are in the book. Uh, they're just, they're much, much bigger. Where, you know, the typical kind of molecule, when most people think about a molecule, when I was writing this book, you know, you're talking about between two and maybe 200 atoms making up the structure of the molecule. And you can kind of look at a picture of it and you can kind of understand it in terms of the chemical bonds that hold it together. In the case of proteins, you're talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or, or millions and millions of atoms all packaged together into one giant molecule and all pack and they're all sort of they're repeating the same basic uh molecular structures over and over again and what counts isn't so much the individual bonds it's the sequence with which they're put together and the information that that sequence encodes in the case of dna it's, it's literally absolutely it's like a ticker tape there's four letters spells out a code. We know what the code is. That's print the table. Um, you know, it's that's the genetic code, and that's the basis of all life. And it's it's like a computer. It's like reading a, t a paper tape uh, in a computer. And the proteins are much more like little machines than they are. You know, you think about them like machines. They do things like cut DNA in a certain place, or you know, be a part of the replication process for DNA or the part that turn, translates DNA into protein. All these things are mechanisms, and you can watch people have made simulations and, and animations of how this works. They're little tiny robot machines. They go around chunk, 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 and they have little mechanisms, and they operate. Uh, and you talk about them and you think about them like you do computers and mechanisms. And that's like a whole other book. Okay, then it would be a fascinating book. But. And I think it would be too, and I would love to interview you again. I, I told you you would go longer than you wanted to, and it's past your time for doing your next show or whatever you're going to do. So I could go on and I could go on for hours because I find this fascinating. But it was really a pleasure talking to you today, and I advise – and if you ever are in the Philadelphia area, although you always seem to stay out west, if you ever come our way, it would be wonderful if you could come and do a signing and a talk at our uh, bookstore. Well, I definitely want to recommend anybody who's in Philadelphia go to the Chemical Heritage Society Museum, which is just a couple blocks from the Liberty Bell, and they have the um, uh, beautiful periodic table video column, 19 feet high, that has the uh, uh, that we did.
I know, I, I know exactly where it is. I'm gonna, I, I'll go there. So thanks again. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay. Great being here. Okay, so that was Theo Gray talking to us about his new book, Molecules, the Elements and the Architecture of Everything, the sequel to Elements. Um, two great books I highly recommend. You, you really can't get them as e-books because they're so beautifully graphically um, rendered, um, but you can get the apps for both Elements and Elements and Actions. Um, they're great. Join us uh, next week on The Avid Reader for another insightful and engaging discussion with what we consider uh, the world's most compelling authors. We've done two of the five finalists for the National Book Award this year. Um, we'll be interviewing people like Nell Zink, who wrote The Wall Creeper, um, Johanna Sig Sigsprud, uh, and uh, she wrote Quartet for the End of Time, which is fascinating. I'm reading it right now. And Mandy Aftel, who wrote the book Fragrant around, uh, about uh, scent and perfume. So once again, thank you as always for joining us. And uh, we will talk to you next week. You've been listening to the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today.